The Lady and the Poet was written and directed by Joe Korn, based on an original piece by James Miller. The play is part of an Ayrshire trilogy, an audio drama series supported by Creative Scotland. Set you by the fire. There was a wild storm brewing outside. Winter nurse you. <laughs> it's a night for the blazing hearth and a wee dram or two to keep out the cold. There's I a warm welcome to your bachelor's club. Need to tip it that. You'll join me in a wee dram the new. Aye? Slange. Oh. oh, it's a good night for the telling of tales in the company of friends. Well, I tell you a tale of friendship. A melancholy tale it is, about a man who was taken from our society of brothers well before his time. Aye. Well, bring your chair in a wee bit close to the fire, and then I'll put in another log. Well, aye, there we are. Our story begins in the county of Ayr, where, in the town of Kilmarnock, John Wilson the printer had just finished binding the first 612 copies of a new book of poetry, written by a young tenant farmer by the name of Robert Burns. Yes, what is it? A packet for you, ma'am. A packet? From whom, Ellen? He didn't say, ma'am, and he didn't wait for a reply. It's a book. So it is, ma'am. Poems, chiefly in the Scottish dialect by Robert Burns. You may go, Ellen. No, wait. Bring me the page cutter, please. Yes, ma'am. I wonder, is this Robert Burns? Was it he who brought me this? And this page is already cut. With a marker in it. The Cotter's Saturday Night. Well, this must be the one I'm intended to read. You may go, Ellen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, here is why I'm given the gift. The poet writes of William Wallace, of my heroic ancestor. O oh, thou who poured the patriotic tide that streamed through Wallace's undaunted heart, who dared to nobly stem tyrannic pride, or nobly die the second glorious part. This is marvellous. I shall send for Mr. Robert Burns at once. <coughs> to stem tyrannic pride, I must meet this poet. Ellen, bring me paper and pen, right away, and tell the groom's boy he is to write to Mauklin to deliver an urgent message. Mrs. Frances Anna Wallace Dunlop of Dunlop was born in that town in 1730. As her name suggests, she proudly claimed descent from the great William Wallace himself, he of the brave heart and the strong mind. Francis, it is said, had a very strong mind of her own. At seventeen, she had eloped to marry her sweetheart, John Dunlop, declaring herself to be deeply in love with him. Uh, to prove it, she went on to bear him seven sons and six daughters. So in love was she that when her husband died thirty-seven years later, Francis mourned him grievously. Indeed, she found herself in a state of such despair 
that she feared it would drive her to the madhouse or the grave until that packet arrived at her door. Another wee drama? No. Aye, of course she will. Madam, I am truly sorry that I was not at home when I was so honoured with your order for my copies and the handsome compliments you are so pleased to pay my poetic abilities. You could not have touched my heart cords more sweetly than by noticing my attempts to celebrate your ancestor, the saviour of his country. The first books I met with in my early years were the lives of Hannibal and Sir William Wallace. In those boyish days, I remember being much struck with that part of Wallace's history where these lines occur. Signed to the Leglin Wood when it was late, to make a silent and safe retreat. I chose a fine summer day to pay my respects to the Leglin Woods, and as I explored each den and dell where I could suppose my heroic countrymen to have sheltered, I recollect that my heart glowed with a wish to make a song on him equal to his merits. Your much indebted and very humble servant, Robert Burns. Ah, can he rap to send his book to Francis Dunlop? She was real kent in Ayrshire society, and she it was who made sure that his fame would quickly spread about the county and beyond. The first edition of his poems was sold out in no time. So far did word get about that on the 27th of November, in that same year, he borrowed a pony and set out for Edinburgh no less, where he met with William Creech. Master Creech was a very influential publisher and bookseller, and Rab sold him his copyright for 100 guineas. Can you imagine that? A hundred guineas. Uh, I feel truthy just thinking about it. Mm. Ah. Well now, it was in the April of 1787 that the first Edinburgh edition of Rab's work was published and he began to taste the heady sweetness of success. So much so that the great portrait artist Alexander Naismith was commissioned to paint his portrait for the frontispiece of his book. But if Francis de Lop had encouraged him this far, she was less taken by the notion of sudden fame amongst Edinburgh society. She feared it would turn his heat and that her poet would be lost as a consequence to his home county of Ayrshire. Sir, I address this care of Mr. Creech. Pray tell me, did you write nothing in the Leglin Wood, and I may be favoured with a sight of when you come west? If you drop me a line, direct it for Mrs. Dunlop of Dunlop by Stewarton. I am truly sorry I did not see you before you went to town, where I dread will be lost the rural bard produced in Ayrshire. You say nobody is so sensitive to praise as poets, the sons of Parnassus. If so, I fear you have too strong a dose of it for even the most callous constitution. All mankind are weak and little to be trusted when all around are conspiring to spoil them and blow up their vanity. You see, I really wish to serve the rustic bard and to preserve him in honour in my county. I am, sir, your most humble servant, Francis Dunlop. Uh, <laughs> Rabbit seems was more concerned 
about living up to his new minted and wealthy friend's expectations of him. He started to doubt whether he really had the talent or the money to move in Edinburgh society. And those English-sounding folk over there, they're very different from us. Their ways are not our ways, so I've heard. I wonder he didn't drown amongst them like a landed salmon. Madam, you're afraid I shall grow intoxicated with my prosperity as a poet. <laughs> Alas, I know myself and the world too well. I do not mean any airs of affected modesty. I'm willing to believe that my abilities deserve some notice, but to be dragged forth to the full glare of learned and polite observation with all my imperfections and crude, unpolished ideas, I assure you, madam, I tell you, I tremble for the consequences. The novelty of a poet in my obscure situation, without any of the advantages which are reckoned necessary, has raised a tide of public notice which has borne me to a height where I am feeling absolutely certain my abilities are unable to support me. I mention this to you to disburden my mind and I do not wish to hear or say any more about it. Robert Burns. Uh, let me pour you another. You will have heard Rab's reputation with the ladies. Of course you have. But his friendship with Mrs. Dunlop was not of that kind. She was a respectable widowed lady, a confidant who was not afraid to speak her mind. Ah, it's true, the poet had an eye, and it seems that Rab's reticence concerning Edinburgh's society did not stifle his appetite for amorous adventures. Uh, dear me, no. Uh, one lady in particular took his breath away. She was a married lady, Nancy Mackles, and he cried her, Claudinda. I tell you this in confidence, madam, and I trust you will not betray me. My song, Clorinda, was a real affair. I truly lost my heart during my stay in Edinburgh, but circumstances are too romantic to be credited even almost from the mouth of truth herself. Ah, oh, love, it is a painful thing, is it not? Our Rab certainly suffered much from it and sought to suffer, it seems, time and time again. And I mind his brother, uh, Gilbert, saying of him that he was constantly the victim to some fear and slaver. Aye, Bill, victim or no, his songs gained the benefit, that's for sure. A fond kiss, and then we sever. A Alas, forever, deep in heart wrung tears, I'll pledge thee, warring sighs and groans, I'll wage thee. Had we never loved so kindly, had we never loved so blindly, never met, nor never parted, we had ne'er been broken hearted. Ah, rap, rap. When your Clorinda sailed away to Jamaica with her husband, I don't doubt you pledged your hot drunk tears, for a wee while at least. But another love was waiting for you back home in Ayrshire. Ah, uh, I can't lie, there's no doubt that our Rab had an awful reputation in the county, and in time it was bound to reach the ears of Mrs. Dunlop herself.
You'll bring no more bastards into this house. You'll take yourself and your disgrace away from this place. Father, where will I go? Mother, you must help me. Too late to call for your mother. Mary, get away upstairs and don't interfere. Why are you so cruel to me? I am your daughter. My daughter? All the more reason you can't abide here. The Kirk teaches us there is those destined for salvation and those bound for damnation. This is the second time you've grown fat with child by that, that incomer, good for naught farmer. And where is he now? I am his wife. You are not his wife. You are his whore. And if I am not his wife, it is because you made me deny him. You took the marriage paper and sent him away. You chased him for money so that he couldn't come back. If I am his whore, then you are a whore master. Enough. <gasps> Get out. I'll go now and you'll not see me again. Rab will come for me and we will be man and wife together. If you think that, you're an even bigger fool than he takes you for. A fool and a sinner. You will burn in hell, as will he, so the Kirk tells us. The Kirk can condemn us all it likes. I just want to be with my Rab. And I will be. I will be. Dear Burns, I have your letter telling me of your marriage. Your picture ought to make a rational man happy, but much depends on the man as well as the poor female, from whom you men generally require all, and to whom a great many of you give nothing. I sit down, as the phrase is, to give you joy. I would fain ask you, however, if you can forgive me questions that are prompted by goodwill, but might seem impertinent. I am aware your marriage will lose you a number of your former adherents. Whether your wife was, or is only now to become the mother of your children, is a point in which I wish myself to be satisfied. I feel all the indelicacy of doing so, yet cannot help putting the question. Tell me, therefore, what prevented your marriage long ago, and on which side came the objections that are now removed? Oh, Burns, let me go one step further and tell you that I tremble for your peace. You have tried your influence with a young innocent girl who sacrificed everything valuable to convince you of her affection. You have indulged in a freedom of life that poisons a man's mind for a husband by leading him to measure his ideas of a woman by the standard of the very worst among whom he had connected himself. If you have hitherto wandered into the devious paths of pleasure, tis now time to strike into the straight road. You lie open to more temptation this way than most other men. But forgive me, I have been preaching, yet it is just what I think, and so you shall have it, for better or for worse. And may God bless you both. Francis Dunlop. Aye, money talks, does it not? As well you know. The young innocent girl in question was a Miss Jean Armour of Mochlin. Although that's not quite how Rob described her at the time. She, uh, uh well, <coughs> at any rate. Her parents would have none of Robert Burns, the poor farmer. Until that is, he returned from Edinburgh, a richer man and a celebrated one. <laughs> It was always the way of the world, eh? My much honoured friend, your letter of the 24th of June is before me. I found it, as well as another valued friend, my wife, waiting to welcome me to Ayrshire. When I write to you, I just write in the fullness of heart. Mrs Burns, madam, is the identical woman who was the mother of twice twins to me in 17 months. When she first found herself, as women wish to be who love their lords, I took some previous steps to a private marriage. 
Her parents got the hint, and in loathing of my guilt at being a poor devil, not only forbade me to her company in their house, but hearing of my rumoured West Indian voyage, they got a warrant to incarcerate me in jail till I should gain financial security in my about-to-be paternal relation. You know my lucky reverse of fortune. On my visits to Mocklin from Edinburgh, I was made very welcome to visit my girl, but when the usual consequences began to betray her, she was turned, literally turned, out of doors. So fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, Till all the seas gang dry, till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. Oh, I will love thee still, my dear, or oh, the sands of life shall run. I wrote to a friend to shelter her till my return. I was not under the least verbal obligation to her, but her happiness or misery were in my hands, and who could trifle with such a responsibility? To the least temptation to jealousy or infidelity, I am an equal stranger. In short, I can easily fancy a more agreeable companion for my journey of life, but upon my honour, I have never seen the individual instance. I have the honour to be, madam, your ever grateful and humble servant. Robert Burns. And so our Rab was in a better position, settled once more as a tenant farmer down at Ellisland. But married as he was now to his bonny and fruitful gene, there was no doubt the wains would keep coming. He must consider his future. In the army, perhaps, when he might buy himself a commission. Mrs. Dunlop moved in influential circles, so Ram sought her opinion, which, of course, she was only too glad to give. Sir, I have read over your letter with much study and attention. I hope and trust you will never think of buying into the army. The pomp of war is more for poetry than practice. And although warriors may be heroes, peace soldiers are mostly powdered monkeys. If we must lose you, there might be other plans talked over. Indeed, when your book reached Mr Smith, Commissioner of the Customs, he suggested a thing that he thought might be procured. He said it was just what he would have wished for himself, had he been in narrow circumstances. Being a salt officer... Should this plan please you, Mr. Smith would instruct you in the proper forms of application. Your much obliged and obedient humble servant, Francis Dunlop. Ach, you're not the only one to wonder at Rabbi becoming an exciseman. But he'd had enough of farming for very little return. And I believe Edinburgh had given him a taste for something better. And Frances Dunlop flung wide yet another door for her handsome protege to ride through. I got the offer of the excise business and as it costs me only six weeks attendance for instructions to entitle me to a commission, I thought five and thirty pounds a year was no bad last resort for a poor poet. The deal came fiddling through the tune and danced a war with excise man. And I mentioned to you my excise hopes and views. I have been once again a lucky fellow in that quarter. The excise man's salaries are now fifty pounds per annum. Five days in the week, or four at least. I must be on horseback and very frequently ride thirty or forty miles ere I return besides four different kinds of bookkeeping to post every day. The deal came fiddling through the tune and danced a war with the excise man and Dilka wife cries old Mahoon I wish you luck of the prize man The deal's a war, the deal's a war The deal's a war with the excise man He's danced a war, he's danced a war He's danced a war with the excise man
We'll mack our modern, we'll brew our drink, we'll laugh, sing and rejoice, man. And money brought thanks to the meekle black deal that danced a war with excise, man. The deal's a war, the deal's a war, the deal's a war with excise, man. He's danced a war, he's danced a war. He's danced a war with excise, man. You'd think he was settled here and sorted for life, would you not? But our Rob had very strong opinions and he didn't keep them to himself. He had no time for the kirk, as we know. All the nonsense about being destined for hell fire. <laughs> All the fairy tales made up by the ministers and believed by those who thought themselves uncagged. Uh, but Rab's ideas went further, and he deemed it very wrong that people should prosper by accident of birth, or by the wealth they made on the backs of the poor. As a boy, Rab had seen his father work himself to death to benefit greedy landlords, and like many another in Scotland, he was reading the news from France with great interest as the revolution to court. Ach, in the meantime, though, he was the averse to bettering himself and his family, nor to a drop of the best brandy produced by the distillers of Nantes. I'll stick with the whisky, mind. Uh, another? I, uh, I will. I will, thank you. I have hopes of a port division. A port division is twenty pounds a year more than any other division, besides as much rum and brandy as will easily supply an ordinary family. This last brings me to my second topic of discourse, namely your unfortunate hunting of smugglers for a little brandy, an article I believe very scarce in your county. I have, however, hunted these gentlemen to better purpose than you, and as a servant of my brother goes from here to Mockland tomorrow morning, I beg leave to send you by him a very small jar of as genuine Nantes cognac as I ever tasted. The jar will reach you, I trust, by some safe channel, though by what channel I leave my brother to direct. Robert Burns. Aye, they were good enough friends still. Rab caught his fifth child after her, Francis Wallace Bumps, and he dedicated a wee song to her. Uh, you may have heard it. Uh, bum, ba -dum, da -da 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 -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, bum, 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 Welcome bum, 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 Lay the proud usurpers low, tyrants fall in every foe, liberties in every blow, let us do our deed. So proud was she of her ancestor, the great rebel Wallace, that maybe Rab thought the lady would be in tune with his own rebellious thinking. If so, he was sore mistaken. With her sons in the army and her daughters married to royalists over the water, she was struck with horror at the thought that the French could murder their king and queen. My dear Dr. Burns, I was once fond of the theme of liberty, but your goddess has behaved in such a way as to injure her reputation and acquire so very bad a name that I find it no longer fit to acknowledge my favour of her. She is too much attached of late to the Society of Butchers, with her handkerchief spotted with the sanguine stains of the guillotine. Madam, you know my politics, and I cannot approve of the whining over the deserved fate of a certain pair of personages. What is there in delivering over a perjured blockhead and an unprincipled prostitute into the hands of the hangman that it should gain for a moment our attention in an hour when the welfare of millions is hung in the scale? And you, Robert Burns. Uh, Rab, Rab, your, your opinions in this case would have been better kept to yourself. You were I a man of strong passions. There's those would call it tap it thrawn. And though it was a letter, you likely should have consigned to the fire. 
Ah, it's a sad thing to lose a fridge. A very sad thing indeed. We were all good friends once, but life provides stones in many a path for friendship to trip on. A mind Rab wrote a song about it. Uh, how did it go? Should all the acquaintance be forgot and never broke a mind? Should all the acquaintance be forgot and all the long sigh? Uh, aye, it was something like that. Ah. No doubt, too, word had reached the lady that his philandering ways with the women and his fondness for the drink were marring his reputation across the county. We all knew him for a generous man, a patriotic man. He wouldn't even take payment for his poems and songs, deeming them a gift to his beloved Scotland. But it's sure his good name has suffered in many a quarter. Now, it seems Francis the Lop had put him and their old acquaintance from her mind. The lady had turned her back on the point, and his letters to her went unanswered. Ah, although I did hear tell she keeps them all still in a little inlaid box, and while she takes them out to read, and that she re... But that's just gossip, my friend. Just gossip. These many months you have been two letters in my debt. What sin of ignorance I have committed against so highly valued a friend I am utterly at a loss to guess. Alas, madam, ill can I afford at this time to be deprived of any of the small remnant of my pleasures. I have lately drunk deep of the cup of affliction. The autumn robbed me of my only daughter and darling child. I had scarcely begun to recover from that shock when I became myself the victim of the most severe rheumatic fever. I know not how you are in Ayrshire, but here we have actual famine, and that too in the midst of plenty. Many days my family and hundreds of other families are absolutely without one grain of meal, as money cannot purchase it. How long the multitude will be quiet, I cannot tell. They threaten daily. Farewell. May all good things attend you. R. Burns. It was the summer of 1796, I mind. Rab wrote her his final letter. His heart had never recovered from the rheumatic fever, and he kent he was dying. Not two weeks later, he was gone. Aye, a sad tale, you say. Did I promise you a merry one? Here, this will cheer us. Madam, I have written you so often without receiving an answer that I would not trouble you again but for the circumstances in which I am. An illness which has long hung about me in all probability will speedily send me beyond that burn whence no traveller returns. 
Your friendship, with which you honoured me, was a friendship dearest to my soul. Your conversation, and especially your correspondence, were at once highly entertaining and instructive. With what pleasure did I use to break the seal? The remembrance yet adds one pulse more to my poor, palpitating heart. Farewell, Robert Burns. Gears are coming. There's the militia now. They say that there's another bairn born the day. No, the day. What will she do? The widow? Weesht, weesht. Have respect. Ach, that's a sad thing. And him no an old man. A poet? A soldier. An exciseman. Sad day, right enough. Right enough. Marty! Present! Arms! Slope! Arms! Mollies with blank cartridges. Make ready. Squeeze in. Fire! Make ready. Squeeze in. It's Gilbert, Jimmy. Can I come in? It's your Uncle Gilbert, you man. Come away in then. How are the Wayne's Gilbert? They're too wee to lose their father. And this one. We'll never see him. The boys are fine. Ye Francis and William are too young to know that's a day. But I'm glad to see you sitting up, Jeanie. I didn't like the thought of you labouring alone while we buried him. A woman's best left at such times, Gilbert. The midwife was with me. But I just wanted to be with my rab. <laughs> I know you did, Jeanie. And I must tell you, you honoured him greatly. There was a firing party of his brother's volunteers in full uniform. And he said he didn't want the awkward squad firing over him. <laughs> when did he say that? Not long before the end. Oh, he was an awful man for joking and carrying you along with him. He made me believe he wasn't dying. Oh no. No rap. The volunteers marched in front of him with their firearms averse as a sign of respect. The military band played a slow march. It brought many of the crowd to tears as they heard it. The great bells tolled for him, and the good folk of the town and county were there, Jeanie. <laughs> then the soldiers formed two lines at the gate of the kirk and pointed their firelocks to the ground and leaned their heads upon them. The beer was borne through between them and forward to the grave. They fired three volleys over him, Jean. He was honoured as, as... As he should have been. Scotland's own bard, they cry him. Yet he dies without a penny to his name. We all loved him, and we'll make well, sure... I loved him, Gilbert. And much good it did me. I mind the day as Doug ran over my clean laundry on the green with its muddy paws. I chased the beast away, and when I turned round, there was my rab, laughing at me. Well, you know, hunt me and all, lassie, he said. It'd be a pleasure to be chased by you. <laughs> Five wains now, and four more buried, and no money even to put a flower on their graves. Oh, don't you worry about that, Jean. Was she there? Uh, who? 
Mrs. Francis Wallace Dunlop of Dunlop. N- 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 was she there? No, I, I... If anybody broke his heart, she did. What do you mean? Never mind, Gilbert. It's all past now. See? Here's wee Maxwell. If Rab were here, he'd be stroking his soft cheek like this. And kissing his head where the wee pulse beats. Just there. See? Ah, my wee man. Your mammy's here. Your mammy's here. It is said that Francis the Lop did write back to him at the end. But who knows for sure? I never saw the letter, and I wonder if Jean burned it in her grief at losing him, in her anger at his pain. She keeps her opinions close, this Jean, so I'll the wager we'll never know the truth of it. But I like to think there was such a letter, and that he read it and was comforted at the last. Well, I'd best be getting back. I think the rain will set in afore long, and my supper's beckoning. <laughs> There's a wee drop left in the bottle. Will we raise a last good toast to friendship? To friendship. May it weather storms, crosswords, and politics. Flanger. Lady and the Poet was written and directed by Jill Korn, based on an original piece by James Miller. The Lady and the Poet is part of an Ayrshire trilogy, an audio drama series supported by Creative Scotland. In The Lady and the Poet, the part of Francis Dunlop was played by Diane Brooks and Robert Burns by Lorenzo Novani. Robert Donaldson was the storyteller and Rachel McPherson Graham was Jean Armour. The parts of James Armour and Gilbert Burns were played by John McQuiston. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Songs were by Robert Burns and were performed by Rachel McPherson Graham. The Lady and the Poet was recorded in Glasgow. Our sound engineer was Paul Gallagher. Production and sound design were by John Boyd. The Lady and the Poet is part of an Ayrshire trilogy, an audio drama series supported by Creative Scotland. <laughs>